about something awesome. Islam and sports. As a young boy, I love football. My whole life revolves around sports. So it got me thinking, is football Islamic? Is playing sports Islamic? And moreover, is playing sports a form of ibadah? So what is football? It is a sport where the aim is to take a ball and deliver it into the net across the pitch. Much like how I want to take my sawab and good deeds all the way to Jannah, but along the way comes shaitan to tackle me and take away my hard-earned sawab. He does this by tricking me into committing a sin. So sins cancel out sawabs. The more ball possession I have, the better the chances are I can carry it to the other end. And once in a while, because of the foul shaitan commits, we get a penalty or a free kick. And that's much like Ramadan. Shaitan is pulled away. And so each time it is Ramadan, it's like shaitan has got a red card and we get a free pass to score many goals as we can. Is football a form of ibadah? This is an interesting question. And the answer is that football keeps us healthy and fit. And Muslims are supposed to be healthy and fit. Moreover, football teaches us cooperation between teammates and Islam is all about the ummah being and acting as one. Football is also teaches us how to reach Jamaat Namaz on time. Nobody wants to reach the game late when it's already started. It also teaches us to be grateful each time we score a goal. We do sajda like Mosala and we appreciate our teammates. Unity, friendship, encouraging, good and forbidding evil is all ibadah. And therefore, football is also Ibadah. Good afternoon. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى شل فارج رحم الله من كره سورة المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد 
روح و ارواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين رب العالمين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به نور مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج First and foremost, I'd like to begin by saying that I'm grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt for granting me the opportunity to be amongst you. Alhamdulillah, Nairobi Jamaat is very special, hometown, and it's a place where we've had very, very many good memories. Naughty memories, good memories, but uh, a special Jamaat in which we've grown up, played sports, and honestly, everything that we have learned in life, this has been, this has been the foundation. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, this jamaat always continues in its prosperities, in all its efforts for the dunya as well as the akhirah, with the barakat of Allah, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. Ahibai, today's lecture and the majlis with the title, The Parameters of the Aql when it comes to understanding the Qur'an. What is the role of the Aql when it comes to understanding the Qur'an? And you will find that ever since the martyrdom of Rasulullah, Islam has gone through a series of changes through the, disintegra the disintegration of the Ummah. The Ummah being disintegrated after Rasulullah and breaking up into numerous sects and numerous madhabs across the passage of time, you'll find that different schools of thoughts came up with different understandings and different ideologies, whether it came to differences in what is political theory in Islam, what is the leadership concept in Islam, when it comes to issues of tafsir of Quran, when it came to issues of deducing a hukum shara'i, a hukum fiqhi from the Quran and from the Sunnah, you will find that there are other schools of thought that heavily believe in qiyas, drawing out analogical conclusions or conclusions through analogy in order to extract a hukum shara'i. And similarly, you find that with the Moving and the passage of time, increase of information, the disintegration, demonopolization of information, you find that there are tons and tons of opinions that float and theories that float within the religious and non-religious circles into what exactly is the role of the akal when it comes to understanding the Quran. And you find that one of the theories that is widespread in this day and age, even though it is not jadid, it is not anything new, it is something from back in the day, but the packaging is different. So you find that one of these theories that are heavily propagated in this day and age or in this time is that number one, the Quran as a book of guidance is sufficient for us to gain hidayah. You don't need to go to la hadith, wa la sunnah, wa la anything of the sort. In fact, their hujjah is that the hadith has been the main reason for sectarianism in Islam. And the hadith as literature is adulterated in the sense that there are many who came across the passage of time and who either fabricated hadith in the name of Rasulullah and in the name of Ahlul Bayt and because you have fabricated and unfabricated mixed together the hadith aslan is not a source of guidance they say Quran is enough why because there is no doubt that the Quran is the final untouched revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is their first premise the second premise is that now that you have the Quran as the undisputed book of guidance, Allah has also given us aql. 
And because you and I have the faculty of the aql, our aql is enough to understand the Quran. You don't need no marja'iyah, you don't need no ahlul bayt, you don't need no sunnah. You have the kitab over here and you have your aql over here. You put these two together. Islam is simple and you can understand Islam with the Quran using the power of the intellect. And now for tonight's majlis, inshallah, we want to analyze the substance in this argument. Is the Quran as a book in itself sufficient as a source of guidance? And number two, what are the functions of the intellect, the parameters of the intellect? Is the akal in itself sufficient to understand the Quran? Lola. And you find that even those people who come forward with this theory that the Quran and the Aqal is sufficient, they don't come and they don't give, they don't come up with this theory from their pocket. La, they have theories that are warranted or so-called theories that are warranted from the Quran. Because you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran in Surah Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." Am ala kulubin akfaluha? Do the people not contemplate over the Quran or do they have locks in their akal? The bongo is so frozen that they can't think. No, the Quran says, La, afalahita the barun al Quran. Meaning that Allah has given us the faculty of the intellect to be able to understand and extract guidance from the Quran. This is one. The second verse of the Quran that they come forward with and they say the Quran is sufficient for us. We don't need anything further than this. No sunnah, no hadith. Yahuwa. From the many verses of the Quran, one that they use is from Surah Al-Baqarah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which we quoted at the beginning of our majlis. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Shahru Ramadan. Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Hudan linnas. Hudan linnas. The month of Shahru Ramadan in which we reveal the Quran which is a source of guidance for the people. I don't know, the verse of the Quran is up here, Lola. It's up here. Who then lin us? So the Quran is a book of guidance. Is a, the book, as a revealed book, is a source of guidance for all mankind. Linnas, this verse of the eye, this verse of the Quran, this eye of the Quran is unrestricted. It didn't say that the book. Quran is a source of guidance for some people and not for some people, for some ethnicities and not for other ethnicities. Law, Hasab al-Zahir, what is apparent is that this verse of the Holy Quran is unrestricted, is a book of guidance for anybody, anyone from Bani Adam. Tayyib. This is the premise that has been put forward by these people who say that the Quran and the intellect is sufficient. How do we go back and how do we counter this response? Before we begin with our response, let me take a few moments to very briefly introduce and explain to you the functions of the aql within the parameters of the deen. This is an introduction to what the aql is, a very summarized introduction. And from then on, we will move on to our responses. All of this with a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The aql, ahibai, is this faculty, this gift which has been endowed upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The faculty of the intellect is what separates us from the rest of creation and makes mankind to have the potential to be the most best, the most superior of all creations, such that the rank of a human being can be higher than that of an angel with the barakah of the aql. You find that the aql is the institution, this faculty granted to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through which we are able to recognize haq and separate it from batil. You will find that even when you go back to the greatest books of Ilmul Kalam, when it comes to proving and establishing the necessity of the existence of a God, the bulk of the proof is Burhan, which is Akli, proof which is intellectual. When it comes to proving now that you have established the necessity of the existence of a God, the next step 
is to establish the existence of one God. This again heavily relies on burhan or proof that is intellectual. Similarly, when it comes to the necessity or the proving the necessity of the existence of Rasulullah, then establishing the necessity of the existence of an Imam after Rasulullah, the necessity of resurrection and that there is a life after death, all these proofs, all these realities are established through the faculty of the Aqal. And you will find that a number of verses in the Holy Quran that speak about this reality actually invoke you to use the Aqal to deduce this conclusion. So for example, you have within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Law kana fi hima alihatun illallah la fasadata. Had there been within the heavens and the earth a God other than Allah, there would be nothing but absolute chaos. Yani, if you had more than one God, two, three, or four gods, there would be chaos on this earth. You find that within this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is invoking the akal to think the perfection within the realm of creation that we are living within is the biggest proof of the singularity of a Lord. If there were multiple Lords, they would be chaotic and they would probably disagree on the system of perfection. So you find that there are multiple verses when it comes to usuluddin and aqidah and akhlaqiyat. The Quran invokes us to use the aql, and for this reason you will find that a number of verses of the Holy Quran that are makkan in nature, just like the way we have verses of the Quran and surahs of the Quran that are either makki or madani, you will find that the makkan surahs had to do with invoking the aql. The words of the Quran were so powerful in the sense that they invoked the intellect to come to the conclusion that truly what Rasulullah is saying is the truth. They cannot be any other true. And therefore you find that the majority of the Makkan surahs that have to do with i'tikadat, that have to do with our Usuluddin and Aqidah, invoke the Aqal. So the Aqal has the ability to understand and to deduce conclusions. For example, the perfection within the system of creation is an undisputed proof in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the role of the aql from one perspective. From a second perspective, what the ulama of usul say is that the aql has the ability of idraq. It has the ability to comprehend between necessitous truths within our jurisprudential literature in order to be able to deduce a hukum shara'i. Yani, the aql has the power to deduce between certain realities within certain truths and then join these two, two truths together in order to deduce a third new truth. This is what they say in the Bahath of Usul known as Mulazamat Akliya or Mustaqillat Ghair Akliya, for example. The role of the akal, so for example, the akal is able to deduce, for example, muqaddimatul wajib wajib, meaning that the prerequisite to a wajib act is wajib. You don't need to have additional text to come and tell you that the prerequisite is wajib. The akal in itself is sufficient as a power to be able to understand this. So for example, if you understand that wudu is a prerequisite to salat, and the salat is wajib, then you don't need any additional text to come and tell you that wudu is also wajib. Why? Because the aql has the ability to comprehend that a prerequisite to a wajib act by default also has to be wajib. So therefore, when it comes to the parameters of the religion, we find that the role of the aql is in terms of it has the ability and the power to comprehend truth. However, the role of the akal has never been to initiate a new hukum or to initiate a new fiqhi ruling. This is not the job of the akal. 
The job of the akal is not to deduce a ruling from zero. The role of the akal is not to come and tell you, for example, that Maghrib is three and that Fajr is two. This is not from the silahiyat, it is not from the capacity of the akal to do this. Rather, these are rulings that are deduced or that are designated by the Lord of the universe and then are conveyed to us by the A'imma. So it is important for us to be able to make the distinction that the Akal has the ability to comprehend between necessity of truth, but the Akal does not have the capacity to initiate and deduce or designate a hukum from scratch. This is in regards to the role of the Akal. Tayyib. If we understand this as an introduction, we come now to the bulk of our majlis. In that, when the person comes and tells you that the Quran is sufficient as a book of guidance, and that Allah has given us an akal, and that the akal is sufficient for us to understand the Quran, you find, unfortunately, these were thoughts that in essential, essentially, these were non-Shia ideologies. But unfortunately, you find these type of theories have crept even within our circles of the Shia Ithna Ashari. They tell you, you know, hadith of Ahlul Bayt and hadith of Imam Ali and Imam Ridha and Imam As Sadiq. Ma'alina hadith of, from Kitabul Kafi and Bihar and Istibsar. We don't need hadith. Quran is sufficient for us and Akal is sufficient for us. Let us try and understand what is the. Is there any substance in this argument? Number one. Is the Quran as a revealed divine book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sufficient for us when it comes to Hidayah Lola? For this, we will refer back to the Holy Quran and we will refer back to a number of verses from the Quran. The first of these, I believe, is from Surah Al Ma'idah, verse number 95. We can refer to this with a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Verse 95. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu. La taktulu sayd wa antum hurumun. This verse of the Holy Quran is speaking about... The ahkam of hajj when you are in a state of ihram in that it is prohibited for you whilst you are in a state of ihram to engage in acts of hunting. So look at what the verse says. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taktulu sayd wa antum hurumun. Hurumun yani in a state of ihram. Wa man katalahu minkum mu'tamidan fa jaza'an mithlu ma katala min al-na'am. And if anyone purposely kills an animal whilst in a state of ihram, then there is a kafara for him. The first part of the kafara is that he has to sacrifice an animal which is similar in terms of its no, similar to the animal that, was, that he has purposely hunted and killed. Ba'ad, you come and see, the verse continues and says, it gives you details about how the sacrifice and this kafara should be given. Until the verse comes and says, Oh, kafaratan, ta'amu miskina aw adlu. Ta'ama miskina. One of the forms of kafara is that if you hunt purposely, while you're in a state of ihram, you have to give kafara. This kafara is what? It amu miskinin. Ta amu miskinin. Tayyib. Did the Quran come and tell you what is the definition of a miskin? Did this Quran, did this verse of the Quran come and tell you how many miskin you have to feed? Did the Quran over here come and tell you what is the food that needs to be given in kafara? And you know, within our fiqh, we have a number of guidelines in that if the sacrifice or the penalty for depending on the type of the animal that you have killed, either the kafara is that you feed 18 people or you feed 30 people. Tayyib, where is this detail mentioned inside of the Quran? 
Sometimes the kafara that is given to feed the people over here is 750 grams of food, yani one mud of food. Where in the Quran is it stipulated that the kafara has to be 750 grams? So then where is my claim when I say that the Quran is a book sufficient for guidance? Come forward over here with the rest of the ayah and it says over here, if you are not able to sacrifice the animal and you're not able to feed the people, then your next form of kafara is that you should fast. Yet the Quran doesn't state over here how many days you have to fast. Is it three days? It is five days? It is seven days? So either we say over here that everybody is free. Feed however many people you want to do. Psalm one person does for two days, one day for five days, one day for seven days. Doesn't work. So you find over here that the Quran gives you the greater guidelines, gives you the bigger picture in terms of what the kafara looks like, gives you the framework. But you are dependent upon the hadith in order to understand the juz'iyat and the details. Similarly, when it comes to salat, how many verses you have inside of the Holy Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa aqimu salat wa atu zakat. Wa aqimu salat wa atu zakat. Verses in the Quran that say wa akimu salat by Allah. Do you find even one verse in the Holy Quran that tells you Salatul Maghrib is three and Fajr is two and the Isha is four? You didn't. Which shows us this is living proof over here that the Quran in itself is not sufficient as a book of guidance for you to gain hidayah altogether. You are in need of hadith. You are in need of divinely selected individuals who will come and will explain to you that in order to fulfill the command of Allah Azza wa Jal when he says wa aqimu salat the ma'asum divinely appointed guide of Allah will come and tell you what the salat is what the parameters of the salat is ya ali sallu ala muhammad wa ala muhammad Tayyip, this is one example. You come and you come forward with a second example. And this one is a very relevant example as well. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 193. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And this was a verse of the Holy Quran that was used by ISIS. There's a verse of the Holy Quran that has also been used by Boko Haram and by every terrorist organization in the name of the religion. Shufu, verse of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, verse 193. <laughs> and kill them until there is no fitna on earth and the deen is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you look at this verse of the holy quran sarih it is absolutely frank, it is absolutely clear in its dalala. This is a fi'il amr, by the way. Those of us who have studied Arabic language, we know waqatilhum, waqatiluhum. Qatiluhum is a command tense in Arabic language. Command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustahablo wajib. If Allah commands us to do something, we don't have an option inside of that. It's wajib. Like the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Quran, wa akimu salat, yani wujub. There is no option. So you find over here the Quran says, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ Kill them until there is no fitna. And it goes on to say, وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ This is even more dangerous. This is the establishment of religious supremacy where you have the right to take the life of anyone who doesn't claim to be Muslim. I tell you, how we understand this verse? 
If you go by the grammar and you go by the Arabic, sorry. Um, you have people like ISIS and people of Boko Haram and Daesh. Adole, when they came and they started beheading and killing people and suicide bombings, it wasn't from the way they say Gotra. Gotra means yeah, without Dalil. No, they had proof they would come. In fact, before every suicide bombing, before every mission, they would come and they would recite verses like this. So I said, Subhanallah, even that guy has aqal. Even that guy comes and tells you the Quran is sufficient for me as a book of guidance. And Ani, I understood from the Quran that we have to kill everybody. How do we go about this? We come and we say, no, they misunderstood the verse of the Quran, Tayyib. If you say that they have misunderstood the Quran, this actually means that our understanding of the intellect, what we perceive to be the intellect, the aqal, has the capability to make mistakes. We come forward and we say, no, these verses are restricted, these verses are under certain conditions, certain criteria, their applications are dictated by a masum imam, particularly when it comes to a form of self-defense. When we put forward all these arguments, we begin to understand that understanding the Quran, the intellect on itself is not sufficient. I am in need of another greater power, another masum, who will be able to convey to me the intended meaning from the Lord of the universe. Otherwise, if I say that the akal is sufficient, like the way I have akal, even Boko Haram has akal. Do you know what is the difference between my akal and his akal? Tayyib. So you come forward and you see that no, this is another proof that when it comes to understanding the verses of the Quran, the akal in itself is not independent because the akal, the akal in terms of its philosophical definition, not aqaidi, Islamic Shia definition, according to its philosophical definition, is prone to error. Furthermore, the third example over here is that if everybody opens the verse of the if everybody opens the Quran and everybody understands the Quran in a different way. Today you open the Holy Quran and when you read verses of the Quran in regards to Rasulullah, some people will come with the conclusion that Rasulullah was actually an illiterate person. And you will find one of our lectures is based on this. That they come forward through the verses of the Holy Quran, they prove La Rasulullah was illiterate. You come to other verses of the Holy Quran, you come with the conclusion, Subhanallah, impossible that Rasulullah was illiterate. Rasulullah was at the peak of wisdom. Subhanallah, from one Quran, a person is able to distinct a person is able to extract the conclusion that the Prophet is illiterate. And using the same Quran, another person is able to deduce another conclusion which is directly opposite and contrary to the first one. That he is at the peak of eloquence, the peak of wisdom. We have a rule in logic, mantik, that states Ijtima'un Nakidain Batil. Meaning that two opposites cannot rationally meet in one place at one time under any given circumstances. These are universal principles of logic that two, no two intellectual people can differ upon. Two opposites cannot come together at any one given point in time at the same time. Because this is contradictory. You cannot have at the same point in time, right now, at the same point in time. It cannot be day and it, not it cannot be night at the same time. And neither can I say, based on this, I can't say that everybody's reading of the Quran is correct. Whether your reading is different from mine and my reading is different from yours. We end up into a theory known as the theory of relativity of truth. Relativity of truth, the first natija, the first outcome is that you subscribe to beliefs such as opposites can meet together at one given point in time. This is Batil according to all people who have studied logic, religious and non religious. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tayyib, if we understand this, Ahibai. The Quran in itself, the human intellect, the human mind is in need of a teacher who is able to come forward and explain to you the intended meanings and make clear for you the intention behind these verses of the Holy Quran. In fact, 
those who tell you oh we should only believe in the quran and that we don't need hadith and we don't need this and that these people themselves didn't understand the quran in fact these people themselves are going against the quran because the quran itself in a number of places tells us refer back to the ahlul bayt so if we come back and the last verse that we would like to reference for tonight from surah ali imran if you refer back to surah ali imran verse number 7 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bismillahir rahmanir rahim huwa alladhi anzala alayka alkitab it is he allah azza wa jal who has revealed upon us the quran minhu now Allah is talking to us about the nature of the Quran. What is the nature of this Quran? Minhu ayatun muhkamatun hunna ummul kitab. You have the Quran is made up of two types of verses. One of them are the muhkamat. Muhkamat are verses that are absolutely solid, concrete, clear. There can be no ambiguity in the interpretation of these verses. Ummul Kitab, this is the core of the message within the Holy Quran. And the majority of the Makkan surahs, these surahs or Makkan verses of the Quran that we said appeal to the intellect, majority of these fall under the Muhkamat. The Muhkamat also have different categories. This is by way of summary we are mentioning. Muhkamat, Tayyib. Hunna Ummul Kitab. But is the entire Quran Muhkamat? clear free of any sort of ambiguity la the quran comes and says wa ukharu mutashabihat mutashabihat shuna i'm not sure what is the translation written for mutashabihat on top so anyone can help me from reading over here allegorical that one I'll need a dictionary, but it means not clear basically. <laughs> it means not clear. Verses that are ambiguous, verses that are shrouded with mystery within them. Now, these mutashabihat, who are the people that follow the mutashabihat? Look at what the verse says. <laughs> <coughs> there are people in their heart they have a form of sickness these are people who are in pursuit of whether religious power they want to establish religious superiority they want to establish for themselves religious power clout whatever you want to name it Zayg is some sort of misguidance they moved away they've strayed away from the main path these people who have gone astray فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ These people who are sick in their hearts, their job is to follow these verses that are from the mutashabihat. These verses that are, you know, allegorical. Allegorical. When in reality the job of the akal is that it was not even designated to touch these parameters. You know the worst type of pharaohism? The worst type of Fir'aun is the Fir'aun of the Akal. When you feel that you are so mighty, that you are so clever, that you are above and beyond the opinion of anyone else. Your understanding is greater than the understanding of everybody else. This is true Pharaohism. This is the true Fir'aun. And even when it comes to understanding ayahs of the Quran, when I feel that my interpretation is the right interpretation of the Quran, Shunu, who said that Aslan, my interpretation of the Quran is equivalent to the intended meaning of Allah. This is not my understanding. My, this is my perception of the understanding of Allah. This is true Pharaohism. True Namrud is inside of our Kichwa. It's inside of our Bongo. Ibtiga wa ibtiga They come and they philosophize about what the meaning of the Quran could be. When it was not even their obligation, it is not even destined for them. They don't even have the capacity to understand this. Then look at what the Quran says. 
Quran, remember, our argument over here is what? The one who tells you, oh, we are people of the Quran and Quran is sufficient. In the Aslan, you didn't understand Quran because the Quran comes to say, وَيَا وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْإِلْمِ There are certain category of people who have access <coughs> to the treasures within the Quran. These ambiguous verses, ambiguous to me and you. <coughs> verses that are shrouded in mystery, mystery to me and you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed a group of people who are known as the Rasikhun al-ilm who are deeply vested in divine knowledge, who have access to these, to the tafsir of the Quran. If you refer back to ulama from the Shia and the Sunnah, and from the Sunnah, including Kunzul Ubmal and Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, <coughs> they are both of the opinion, together with Tawatur, Tawatur from the Shia Ahadith, that the Rasikhun al-Ilm is none other than Rasulullah, and beginning with Mawlana Amir al muminin Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. <coughs> the Quran in itself tells you that we are in need of Ahlul Bayt. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <coughs> Therefore, Ahibai, it is a lack of understanding when somebody comes and tells you that the Quran is sufficient for guidance and you don't need Ahlul Bayt. Aslan, they didn't understand the Quran because the Quran tells you go to Ahlul Bayt. <coughs> and in this month of Shahrul Ramadan, it is important that as we build our relationship with the Quran, we build our relationship with the Quran in the right manner. That if you truly want to extract full guidance from Ahlul Bayt, from the Quran, it cannot be independent of the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. You find that this is an established fact when it comes to Tafsir al Quran within the Shia Ithna Ashari. In fact, regardless of whether you are an Usuli or whether you are an Akhbari that even the zawahir of the Qur'an, those verses of the Qur'an that are zahir and apparent, you cannot deduce a meaning or an intended interpretation from that verse of the Qur'an until and unless you go back to the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Come and see what has Ahlul Bayt said about this verse in order to understand it in the correct manner. I know I have gone over my time, but we will spend maybe three or four minutes with your permission to remember the Masaib of Ali Muhammad because all ilm that we have is from Ali Muhammad and life was taken from them and they gave sacrifices in the greatest of manners for you and I to have a deen and to benefit from this deen. <coughs> Masaib Ali Muhammad, Ya Shi'at Ali Muhammad from the greatest tragedies that fell upon Imam Zainul Abideen the tragedy of him having to leave Karbala while seeing the bodies of his father and the companions of Imam al Hussein and his family members unburied on the plains of Karbala, Allah. You know, Ahiba, it is so difficult for somebody to see an unburied body. Sometimes you will see if there is a death that has happened in the community, you will find even the family members, even though the body has been given a ghusl, even though the body has been given a coffin, but so long as it has not been buried, the family is not at ease. So then what about Imam Zainul Abideen on the 11th of Muharram when he had to leave Karbala to go towards Kufa? From the tragedies of Imam Zainul Abideen was for him to see his family members, the women of his household, being taken as prisoners from city to city, being whipped and being hit and slapped. Allah, Allah. But the tragedy of Imam Zainul Abideen on the 13th of Muharram when he returned to Karbala to bury his father, Abba Abdullah. The people from Bani Asad say, we looked at Imam Zainul Abideen 
from a distance. After he buried all the companions, he walked towards the body of Imam al Hussein. The people from Bani Asad, one of them, say, We saw Imam Sajjad walk to the body of Imam al Hussein. He threw himself on the body and he began to kiss every part of the body of Zayyid al Shuhada. He said, We could hear Imam Sajjad weeping and wailing, but then Imam Sajjad did something we didn't understand. <coughs> we didn't understand. He says, Imam Zainul Abidin lifted the body of Abba Abdullah to put it into the Qabr. The first time he lifted the body, Imam Sajjad sat down. A second time, Imam Zainul Abidin tried to lift the body, but he sat down. Three times, Imam Sajjad... <coughs> Three times Imam Sajjad tried to lift the body of Imam al Hussein. Three times Imam Sajjad sat down. The people of Bani Asad came forward and said, Ya Zainul Abidin, should we help you lift the body of Abba Abdullah? Yeah. If you were to ask Sajjad, Sajjad would say to you, This is not the heaviness of the body of my father. Every time Imam Zainul Abidin lifted the body of Imam al Hussein from the right side, the left side of the the body falls down. Sajjad lifts the body from the left. The right side falls down. This is because of the manner in which they trampled on the body of Imam al Hussein with horses. Not a single bone in the body of Abba Abdullah was left except that it was broken. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of Ali Muhammad to accept our hajat and hajat to all of those who have attended this majlis and those who are following this majlis, Ya Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a night like this to forgive us our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those of us who are not in the best of health, Allah azza wa jal, by the sake of Ali Muhammad to grant them shafa'ah in the quickest of times. Those of us who have lost our loved ones, our marhumin and marhumat, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their garden, make their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah. Wa akhiru da'wana adilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen yakulu la ta'ala inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.